Hello, hello, welcome back to another section of The Not So Perfect Man by Valerie Frankel. And I'm recording this at night, so you might uh, hear some crickets or whatever in the background as we live next to the woods. So, but we are finishing up this book in the next two sections. So, if you're new to the channel here, hi. I'm Julie, and uh, you might want to go back a few videos to get caught up with this one, because we've just got two more sections to go on here, and then we will start a new one after that, which I will announce next time. But today, we're going to start on page 269 with chapter 33, and let's jump in. Chapter 33, Friday, September 12th, 6.30 p.m. It's a girl, said Jane. She says she met you at the Financial Times media luncheon last week. Lisa something. Oh. <laughs> Peter was in a hurry, throwing folders and a pack of gum into his briefcase and slamming it shut. I don't have time to talk. Ask her what she wants. Jane said she wants to schedule a lunch. I think she'd be happier with dinner. Another one. Amazing how they came out of the woodwork when news of his separation traveled across the transom of finance journalism. Peter had barely said a word to anyone about his marital situation, but people in his office knew he couldn't be reached at home and that faxes and packages should be sent to his temporary address on Avenue A. Jane, Peter suspected, filled in the blanks. Random phone calls from young women started coming in. He had to admit... He liked the attention, so much so that he sought it out. He never used to go to media events, cocktail parties, or award ceremonies, but these days, when the invitations hit his desk, he was quick to RSVP. Not that he'd do anything with these women. They wanted to use him. What was in it for him, sex? He was nowhere near that point. One particularly frustrating aspect of the separation with Eileen was that their sex life at the end had been fantastic like when they first got married. Ready to go, Peter checked his desk one last time. Was he forgetting anything? His eyes fell on the empty space where the wedding photo used to be. Jane's idea. She had hidden the picture, removed the sad reminder. He picked up his briefcase and left his office. Before he could extricate himself completely from the world of work and get downtown to meet Betty for dinner, Jane said, Where's the fire? With her small boned hand, his secretary pointed at the chair next to her desk. He hesitated. He wasn't up for a chat with, with Jane, but he sat as instructed. Seeing her naked, he didn't have the balls to refuse her anything. He'd trespassed on her in the most personal fashion. He owed her big time, and part of his payment was to listen to whatever geyser of wisdom spouted from her lips. He said, I'm already late. Check the watch, look pointedly at the desk clock, straighten the tie. Another bait date with Betty? she asked. It's not a date, we're having dinner and then going to a movie. Dinner and a movie, said Jane, and then back to her apartment to sleep on the couch. Only you would make assumptions. Betty's my sister in law, that's practically incest. You've got bonking on the brain. Much as I admire you and wish ardently that women were like you, in this one instance, you are wrong, he said. I don't think you're sleeping together, said Jane. I do think it's strange that you choose to live in her tiny apartment. Wouldn't you be more comfortable in a hotel? Peter sighed. This was exactly what he'd wanted to avoid. I don't have an ulterior motive. I just like the company. Jane nodded patiently, condescendingly. Betty is, what, 32? I guess. How old was Eileen when you got married? I can see where you're going with this, he said. Betty and I are friends. We have a lot in common. Can't a man and a woman simply be friends? While he protested, Jane opened her desk drawer. She pulled out a fa framed photograph, the wedding picture. He hadn't seen it in months. Look at this, she said. He looked. Peter and Eileen staring at each other, grinning goofily, in a love as roiling and deep as the ocean, the happiest he'd ever been. How had things gone so wrong? Eileen's hair was darker then, her skin pinker. She was glorious. He had an ill-fitting tux, a sheen of sweat, bedhead. What had she seen in him? 
Jane said, You can't tell me that Betty today isn't the spitting image of Eileen 11 years ago. He handed back the picture and stood to go. I'll be in early tomorrow. We've got a staff meeting at nine. Before you leave, call the senior editors and remind them that lateness will not be tolerated, and I expect researched story ideas, not vague notions. Jane tucked the frame back into her drawer. Yes, sir, she said. Is there anything else? Sir? Your annual, annual review forms are on my desk, he said. Please fill them out and say something bad about yourself for once. Personnel might catch on. Jane said, I'm recommending a 15% raise. Recommend 10, he said, and leave it on my desk to sign. With that, Peter made a dash for the elevator. He refused to contemplate what Jane was suggesting about Betty. The sisters might look alike, but their personalities were completely different. Even if looking at Betty did evoke memories of a young Eileen, Peter would never touch his sister-in-law. He wouldn't dare. She'd be horrified. Even more abhorrent, she might not be horrified. The whole issue gave him palpitations. He knew he'd have to move out of her one bedroom at some point. Betty hadn't fired a leave now warning shot like Jane and Tim had, but Peter knew he wasn't good for Betty. She was content to spend every evening watching videos with him. She was a beautiful young woman. She needed to go out. Peter strode out of the building into the September heat. Still felt like August in the city. He loosened his tie, remarking to himself, as always, that he sweat so much less than he had last summer. He walked across Madison Avenue along 45th Street toward Grand Central. As usual, he stopped at Hudson News, the big one, to watch if anyone picked up a copy of Bucks. He couldn't resist flipping through a copy himself, turning immediately to his story on price gouging in the personal services industry. He'd written a nasty screed on the arbitrary billing practices of personal trainers, nutritionists, private chefs, and interior decorators, including a first-person sidebar about Peggy McFarthing. He hoped to God that she went out of business because of it. He hadn't gotten a phone call from her lawyer, not that she had any basis to sue him. He would described his own experience. No slander in that. He sent a dozen copies to Peggy's office with a note, thanking her for all she'd done for him. He chuckled to himself, thinking of her reading his description of her as a brill scarecrow. Excuse me, said a lilting female voice. Peter looked up from his article to see a woman, make that a woman, blonde ponytail swinging high on her head, tight stretchy bike shorts, a midriff bearing t-shirt that re revealed a tan, crunched to core, crunched to concrete belly, skin that practically snapped with dewy freshness. He guessed she was 21, 23 tops. Peter stepped out of her way, clearing a passage to the magazine racks. To his amazement, she picked up a copy, a copy of Bucks. She flipped to his article. She saw him staring and noticed that his magazine was opened to the same page. She pointed at her magazine and then at his. They laughed, together, like old dear friends. She said, I'm a personal trainer. This article is the talk of New York sports. Some customers have come in demanding flat fees. He don't say, Peter marveled, loving the idea that a bevy of hard female bodies and skimpy spandex leotards were evoking his name and prose, even to revile him. Perhaps the harem of spinning instructors would try to pile on top of him in protest. She said, A lot of trainers are pretty pissed off about it, but I think it's good. Really? Yeah, it's wrong to charge some old geezer three times as much for an hour just because he's willing to pay it. Yeah, he agreed. He would agreed to anything she said just to watch her talk. When she spoke, she bobbed her head up and down, telegraphing yes, 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 with each symbol. A lot of male trainers do the same thing, jacking up the price for old ladies. That is pathetic, he said. I'd never do it, she said. I have this one customer. He's divorced from his wife, and he's really lonely. You can tell because all he does is talk about getting in shape to meet women. He asked me out a couple times, and I keep telling him that I don't date clients. He asks about other girls at the club, too. 
I don't have the heart to tell him that none of the other girls would date a guy that old, even though he's in pretty good shape. I tell you, there's nothing sadder than a hard-up, lonely, divorced older man. Peter nodded along, yes, 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 for the duration of her confession, picturing her bending over a glute builder, some stooped gray-haired granddad looking on. Peter didn't want to ask, but felt compelled. How old is this geezer? Ancient, she said. In years, he asked. I'd have to guess, she said. Please don't say 40, he prayed. Go ahead. She stopped, nodded, nodding suddenly, and said, How old are you? 30, he said. You thought 25, right? She laughed. So did he. Together, they were such dear friends. She said, Okay, I'll tell you. Please don't say 40. He prayed harder. Yes? He's at least 50. 50? Peter practically shouted the number with relief. And he's hitting on 20-year-olds? You should charge him double just to teach him a lesson. It's more fun to make him do a hundred military-style push-ups, she said, bobbing her head. He liked her so very much. He held out his hand. She shook. I'm Peter, he said. Peter Vermillion. She mouthed his name to herself. You're the guy who wrote this article? She asked, reverence in her voice. He tried to be humble. I wouldn't have admitted it, but you're such a scrupulous woman. Pleased to meet you, she said. I better be going. She was leaving? Wait, he said. You haven't told me your name. We could talk again, over drinks or dinner. The blonde trainer smiled radiantly, head bobbing yes, 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 while she said, No, 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 I can't go out with you, Peter. Even at 30, you're still way too old for me, and you seem like the kind of guy who wants a relationship. I don't do that. I hook up. Before he insisted he didn't want a relationship, Peter figured he should find out what she meant. Hooking up? He asked. It sounded painful. Going out in groups of girls and picking up groups of guys, taking them back to someone's apartment and having safe yet casual sex, she said. I think I'm leaning toward lesbianism anyway, and even if I were attracted to you, I couldn't do much about it until my labial piercings heal. Labial piercings, he said. Four of them. Two on each side. Very tasteful. Refined, she said, nodding yes, yes, yes. Peter checked his watch, straightened his tie, cleared his throat. <clears throat> he said, I'll be going now. She smiled again, bobbing. He couldn't keep himself from glancing at the crotch of her bike shorts for visible signs of hardware. He replaced the magazine on the rack and walked off toward the subway, trying not to, hard not to imagine what a labial piercing looked like. He also tried hard to forget something she'd said, but the phrase... Hard up, lonely, divorced, older man rang in his head. Page 279, Chapter 34. Saturday, September 13th, 7 p.m. Betty arrived right on time. She was embarrassed to be so punctual. Punctuality meant only one thing, that she had nothing better to do on a Saturday night than babysit her nephew. Frida welcomed her with a hug. Justin is in a mood, she warned. Betty had seen his moods. I can handle it, she said. Betty's strategy with her nephew's crankiness was to ignore him completely. It worked amazingly well. When Frida tried to crack a bad mood of Justin's, she hovered, cajoled, eventually got angry, which plain as day to Betty only worsened the kid's temperament. Coming back, said Frida. Betty followed her into the bedroom. Her sister fussed with her black cocktail number. We're going to some magazine party, said Frida. David said it'll be a bunch of bond wonk wonks pounding dirty martinis. Fun, said Betty, settling in on the bed to watch her sister finish dressing. David gets invited everywhere. Sam and I never went to parties. We never spent time with other people, said Frida. Betty said, Every time you say something positive about David, you throw in a comparison to Sam. You and Sam never spent time with other people because you couldn't tear yourself out of bed. 
How is the sex with David, by the way? Her sister struggled to latch a string of pearls around her neck. Betty got up to help. She stood behind Frida in front of the full-length mirror. After securing the clasp, she looked at their reflection. Betty was taller, darker, her hair straighter, but they were sisters. Anyone could see that. Frida said, sex with David is fine. Fine? We've only done it a few times. It takes a while to get used to each other's bodies, said Frida. It took you and Sam about two seconds, said Betty. Frida applied blush. You never liked Sam, she said. You never supported the relationship. Betty hadn't gotten to know Sam well enough to dislike him. I, I wasn't sure if Sam was right for you. I'm not sure David is either. But what do I know? I mean, it's hard to know what's right when you're on the inside of a relationship. It's impossible from the outside. Frida said, You miss Earl. Bingo. Betty had successfully worked through her apathy and her antipathy, antipathy toward the bastard Earl. Now that her raw emotions had been cooked all the way through, she found herself missing him. Wanting to go back to the morning, she walked into her office and turned her life upside down. Frida said, David told me something odd about Eileen. He said that people at Cash are saying Peter left her. Can you believe the viciousness of office gossip to make up a complete lie and spread it around? Eileen's secret wouldn't keep. Frida would be the last to know. Betty said, how does a rumor like that get started? David said it comes from people at Bucks. They're saying Peter is shacked up with a much younger woman in some Lower East Side hovel. What does Eileen say? asked Betty, wondering how staffers at Bucks knew how what her apartment looked like. Frida said, I haven't breathed a word to Eileen. She'd be furious. David says she's been working like a dog on some big bankruptcy story and barely interacts with anyone at work. Betty hated hearing that. So now she'd cut herself off from her colleagues too. Betty had been pushing Peter to contact his wife to make up with her, but he was waiting for Eileen to make the first move. He said he'd waited this long, he could wait a little longer. It was a stalemate. Betty in the middle, keeping Peter's location a secret from Eileen and Eileen's pregnancy a secret from Peter. The whole cloak and speculum business was starting to wear on her nerves. Betty felt locked in their conflict, unable to break free, but not quite wanting to, since if she were unencumbered with secrets and a house guest, she'd be duty-bound to battle her own demons. The plastic folder with the goods on Earl remained under her mattress. She wasn't ready to mail it, thereby letting him go. He mistreated her. He manipulated her. He was a liar, a cheat, a swindler, and a jerk. But he made her pulse race. That had to count for something. Maybe it counted for everything. Not for Frida, apparently. She'd switched from sex to security in a blink. Betty watched Frida primping, wrestling with her curls so they fell just so. She seemed content. Betty wanted to ask Frida how she'd let go of Sam so easily, whether she still thought about him. Betty could not stop thinking about Earl. Changing the subject, Betty said, What's Justin's problem tonight? He's pissed off that I'm going out, said Frida, finishing her face and spritzing obsession. I better go. I'll call you. If you want to stay at David's tonight, I can sleep over, volunteered Betty. Thanks, said Frida, but I'm definitely coming home. With David? Don't know. You'd willfully pass up the opportunity for some of that fine, fine sex? Asked Betty. I'll tell you what, said Frida. If I do bring him home, you can have sex with him. Don't think I won't, said Betty. Ignoring Justin took a lot out of Betty. She needed sustenance, so she made popcorn in the microwave and put it in a large bowl on the living room table. She ate a handful, pushing the bowl an inch closer to Justin. From his nest of pillows on the couch, he looked at the popcorn but didn't dive in. 
but he continued to nibble, making exaggerated yummy sounds, inhaling the butter scent, waving nosefuls of it into her face. Justin could only take so much. Finally, he edged forward on the couch and started eating. A few mouthfuls later, his mood broke. Justin and Betty tossed kernels into each other's mouths and ended up whipping the corn at each other's eyeballs as hard as they could. More popkin popcorn ended up on the floor than in their stomachs. Black and white wandered over, eating what they could. Black started choking and then puked, which made Betty and Justin laugh. The absent-mindedness of popcorn eating loosened Justin's lips. No one will ever be my dad except my dad. Your mom knows that, said Betty. But it would be nice to have a stepdad, don't you think? Justin said, I liked it better with Sam when he wasn't away. He spent every night here with me. He never made mom go out. Grown-ups need to go out, said Betty. She can go out with me, said Justin, completely missing the point. Betty said, she needs to go out with a man. Your mom has always had boyfriends. She doesn't feel happy unless someone pays attention to her in a special way. There. That had to make sense, even to a six-year-old. He seemed to absorb the information, pausing motionlessly as if as his hard drive of a brain spun and processed the data. I'll pay special attention to her. No, no, you're not getting it. Uh, I'm talking about grown-up stuff. You probably don't understand. Are you talking about sex? Asked Justin. Let's stick with special attention, she said, not sure what the proper per perimeters were on this conversation. Justin said, not all grown-ups care about that. I bet my teacher doesn't. You'd be surprised, said Betty. You don't seem to care about it, he said. You never have boyfriends, except that long-haired guy at Christmas. But just that one time. Mom said he dumped you. Sorry about that. Good riddance, said Betty. Justin continued. If you don't want special attention, then you're like a kid. That's why you're here. You'd rather be with your own kind. She shook her head. <laughs> your logic is flawed. She explained, I'm a fully formed adult who makes rational decisions, weighs risk slash benefit ratios, and then acts accordingly. I've decided that special attention isn't worth the pain it can cause. I'm an adult ruled by reason. A child is ruled by desire, like your mom. By that analysis, she's more chi childlike than I am. Justin stared at her, unblinking. She said, did you get that? He said, you lost me. Which part? I don't know what logic means, he shouted. I'm only six. She laughed. Sometimes I forget, she said, grabbing him and giving him a squeeze. He sat on her lap, and they ate popcorn out of each other's hair. He said, sounds to me like you're playing hide and seek. You're good at hiding, but you're supposed to let yourself get found. Betty asks, are you still in therapy? He shook his head. The insurance ran out. Good, she said. You've clearly had enough of that already. That was it. Okay. Page 287, chapter 35, Tuesday, September 16th, 10.30 a.m. <clears throat> what brings you here today? Asked Denise Bother. She wore a smart sweater set. Cotton, breathable, purple. It reminded Frida of orchid petals. I'm worried about Justin, replied Frida. He asked his first grade teacher, a 28-year-old woman, if she needed sex. Or special attention from a man was how he put it. That doesn't sound alarming, said Dr. Bother. Many first graders are curious about sexuality. He resents it whenever I leave the house, said Frida. He whines constantly. He's clingy. Dr. Bother crossed her legs and rested her interlocked hands on top of her knee. She said, let's put Justin aside for a moment. How are you doing? Great. Good, said Frida. She was. 
The school year in full swing, Frida was settling into a daily routine. Summers were endless, especially the weeks between camp and school. Fall was finally here, and Frida felt centered, steady enough to hang around a bit at drop-off to chat with the moms, moms, exchanging stories of what I did this summer. One mom, Sandy, had asked her, Are you still dating the actor? Oh no, said Frida. I'm done with him. We broke up a few months ago. Sandy said, You'll find someone else. Frida said, I already have. David is an award-winning financial journalist. He works at my sister's magazine. She laid it on thick. He's a recently divorced dad, but alimony and child support aren't a problem for him. Money isn't a problem for him. Frida watched Sandy's eyebrows go up. He's got blue eyes, brown hair, six feet tall, a marathoner. She could get into this, bragging about David as if he were her prized bull at the fair. Sandy said, you sure can rope them in. Frida said, I've been fortunate. Sandy said, he sounds like a keeper. You mean Sam wasn't? Frida asked, forgetting for a minute that she was supposed to be madly in love with David. Sandy had given her a puzzled stare, then she said, well, congratulations, David sounds perfect. David was letter perfect. So why wasn't she perfectly happy? Dr. Bother said, If you're doing so well, why did you call for an emergency appointment? Don't waste my time or yours by saying this is about Justin. I'm afraid of being alone, said Frida. You're human. The man I've been seeing, Sam, said Dr. Bother. Sam and I broke up, she said quickly. I'm with David now. He's been my friend for a while. We can talk for hours. He fits into my life. He loves Joss, Justin. His daughter, Stephanie, is moving to New York. If we get married, she'll be si Justin's sister, and we can get her into Packer. David says he wants to get married anyway, but this school situation has pressed the issue. The wedding plan may seem, to rush, seem rushed, but I can tell we'll have a good life together. You describe him as a friend, said Dr. Brother. We've been lovers for a couple of weeks. How's that part of it? asked the shrink. Nice, said Frida. Fine. Friendly? Very. Why did you and Sam break up? asked Dr. Brother. Frida tried coming up with a pithy answer. It wasn't working, she said. Dr. Brother nodded knowingly, smugly. The passion died. No, Actually, if anything, it got more intense. You stopped loving him? No. Did he stop loving you? No. He didn't get along with Justin. They liked each other, said Frida. You fought often? asked the shrink. Frida shook her head. We hardly ever fought, only about my frustration with his travel schedule. Was he emotionally withholding? No, he said I was. Did you resent his financial situation? No. Dr. Bother was silent for a minute. I don't understand why it wasn't working. Frida blur blurted, Neither do I. The pressure just built and built. He was gone so much. My sisters made me wonder if he was using me. Justin didn't seem so enamored of him, but I still love him. It's just like it was before. I can't stop thinking about him. Oh, shit. The tears again. What was it about this couch? Frida reached for the box of Kleenex. I made a terrible mistake, she wailed. You're here to talk about how to fix it, prompted Dr. Bother. She shook her head. I can't fix it. I'm here to learn how to live with it. Why can't you fix it? I acted terribly the night we broke up. I was dismissive and condescending. I must have made him hate me. Besides, he's doing so well without me. It's almost as if our breakup was what he needed to succeed. I can't step back in and be his bad luck charm. The timer bell rang. We have to stop, said Dr. Bother. We should schedule another appointment, and I'd advise you to hold off on marrying David. Frida stood, relieved to tell someone the truth about how badly she missed Sam. The relief was so monumental. 
Frida decided that unburdening herself was all she needed to do. Now she could move on. She could let him go. Frida said, I'll call you for an appointment. Dr. Baller said, we can make one right now. I've got to run. I'll call you, said Frida, lighter than she'd been in months. Ready to see David in a whole new light. Ready to embrace a life with him. The doc smiled, knowingly, smugly. One last thing, she said. Yes, asked Frida. Comfort and security are appealing, she said. You should know. You've been there with Greg. You'd better ask yourself how badly you want to go back. Page 293, Chapter 36, Wednesday, September 17th, 4.09 p.m. So, it had come to this, thought Eileen, paging through the short stack of legal papers the packet had been messen messengered from Peter's office this morning with a handwritten note. Eileen, first step, legal separation. One year from the date of the countersigned document, we can file for uncontested divorce. No lawyers needed, notarized, SASC enclosed. Happy birthday, Peter. Eileen's 40th birthday wasn't for another month. She'd let Peter's in August birthday, his 41st, blow by unacknowledged. She dragged her fingers over the raised seal of the notary stamp by Peter's signature. This was the grand romantic gesture she'd been waiting for? When she found the envelope, her assistant had placed it prominently on her chair, instead of in her inbox. Eileen's heart skipped a beat. The box logo, Peter's handwriting, he'd finally contacted her. She picked up the package and sat down. Drawing a breath, she opened it. It wasn't, she saw immediately, an impassioned plea to let him come home. Eileen started reading the documents, her skin prickling with shock. At that moment, her assistant stuck her head in to ask if Eileen needed coffee. Eileen was certain that her assistant had been the one churning the gossip mill. The whispering had gotten loud enough to reach her boss's office. Mark responded to the news with an email. He asked her what she was going to work on next. That is, if you think you can handle a big story right now, he'd written. I can put you on banknotes if you like to take it easy for a while. Banknotes was a front-of-the-book section of short items, two 300-word boxes on employment news, minor mergers, and sell-offs. It was the low-rent section of the magazine, strictly relegated to associate editors and junior writers who were hungry enough to toil over glorified, glorified blurbs. Banknote stories were way, way beneath her. Eileen send, sent... Typo. Mark a reply, suggesting she do a lifestyle feature on the hidden expenses of divorce. She hadn't heard back since. Her assistant repeated the offer of coffee. Eileen told her to go away, close the door, and leave her the fuck alone. She said the fuck with enough emphasis that her lip bounced off her teeth, sharpening that F to a knife point. Her assistant, the poor girl, was as dim as a porch light scurried away like the rat she was. In seconds, Eileen could hear her murmuring on the phone. She bent her head to study the separation papers. Ten minutes later, she heard a gentle tapping on her door. She ignored it. David Eisen slid her door open anyway. He sat down in the chair opposite her desk. He was smiling, beaming. Her separation was a happy event for him. He was no longer the only one with a failed marriage on staff. Eileen said, what's with the grin? He said, I'm bursting. Bursting with sympathy? Don't do it here, she said. I just had the carpet cleaned. I'm supposed to keep my mouth shut, and I will. I'm relying on your powers of deduction, he said. At dinner with your sisters the day after tomorrow, Frida is going to shock and amaze you. This was about Frida? Eileen didn't know if she should feel relieved or insulted. She said, The suspense will have to kill me until then. I'm too busy to talk right now. She gestured to the door. David laughed. He laughed. He was bursting with the giggles, apparently. He said, 
I'll go. But first, I want to thank you for introducing me to Frida. You'll know just how grateful I am in a couple of days. As soon as he was gone, Eileen stuffed the envelope into her purse and ran out of the office. Peter's signature had been notarized that morning. Not to be outdone, Eileen would get her counter-signature notarized this afternoon, and she wouldn't just pop the papers into the SASE. She'd send them certified mail. Overnight certified mail. She'd spend the extra $20, and then messenger Peter the receipt. She got the papers notarized at the newsstand in her building lobby and walked the dozen-odd blocks to the post office at 3rd and 54th. It was an old one, built at the turn of the century, the last century. Stone mosaic floors, 30-foot ceilings, a hanging chandelier, a long, winding, circular staircase to the second-floor balcony, which overlooked the teller action below. A prime example of old-world opulence. Eileen walked up to a young man in an immaculate uniform, security, and asked, Excuse me, do you know where I can get a letter certified? Information desk, he grunted. Rude prick. She'd almost let herself get swept up by the grandeur of the setting and the crispness of his uniform, but she was still in New York and that meant waiting. The information desk had a line. From there, she was directed to another line. She got on it and watched the seconds tick by on her watch. She was fidgeting so much, and with such aggression, she bumped into the man ahead of her online. He turned profile to accept her apology. Then he spun all the way around to look at her. Arlene, hello, he said. What in the... She said, Sam Hill, hello to you. The impoverished actor man stood before her, wearing cargo pants, a down jacket, and old sneakers. She realized with a sinking stomach already a pixel width from nausea, that she'd have to talk to him for the duration of the wait, or ignore him with such focus and silent volume that she might have to flee the post office, which she simply could not do. She'd have to stand her ground and talk to him. Eileen said, So, how have you been? Sam said, I've been all right. You are pregnant? Did it show? She was only four months. She hadn't seen... He hadn't seen her for a while, so her weight gain would seem dramatic. Yes, but I'm not out with it yet. Waiting for the amnio. That was the correct response. If she decided to terminate, the window was still open, she would blame it on the bad test results. He said, congratulations. Hmm, she said, nodding. I'm surprised to see you. I bet you never wanted to see me again. You don't seem surprised to see me, she said. He shrugged. Small city. He bore into her eyes. His were bottomless, a dark chocolate sea. She found herself staring, trying to find his pupils. He said, don't get lost in there. She blinked and looked over his shoulder. You can take a step, she said. The line had moved forward an inch. We should get to the teller window by sometime next week. He stepped ahead and said, I don't have much time. I ran out of a rehearsal at City Center to do this and had no idea it would take so long. We leave for London a week from Friday to do a two-week run of Oliver. We? she asked. Had he hooked up with yet another chorus girl? We, the entire company, he said. I'm here, on this stagnant line, to renew my passport. I hadn't realized it had expired. I have to send it certified mail to the Passport Bureau in Washington today and pay a huge fee to get a new one in one week. That fee must hurt, she said snarkily. Bad girl. She'd never survive the wait on this creeping line if she couldn't be civil. I'm sending legal documents, too. She flashed the package, not giving him a chance to read the Marriage Bureau address. How's Peter? asked Sam. He's well. How's Frida? Brave of him to ask. She's doing great. She's seeing someone, a fantastic man. He must be incredibly rich to meet your approval, said Sam with an even smile. I fixed them up, she said, and he is quite comfortable, actually. Eileen thought she saw a ripple in the sea of his eyes, but his expression remained the same. He was a talented actor, she thought. He said, I'm glad she's happy. If she is. Oh, she's happy. How the hell would you know? 
he asked with a sudden venom. Eileen felt a tap on her shoulder. A large woman, black in a blue dress, said, The line is moving. Sam took a step toward, a step backward. Eileen moved the six inches toward him. She said, Frida is my sister. I've known her for 36 years. You lasted how long? Nine months? He smiled, slow, enjoying this. You put the doubts in her head about money, about my commitment. Eileen said, you have no idea how miserable she was when you left town. She was miserable to be apart because of how happy we were together, he said. She'll never be that happy again. Eileen scoffed. <laughs> you don't know that. I do, he said. Her feelings matched mine. Frida and I talked about it all the time. We'd never been as happy before. We won't be again. You are to blame. Move along, said the woman behind Eileen. They strode two paces, ensemble. Right, left. Right, right, left, left. Uh, Sam backward, Eileen forward, as if they were dancing. Frida isn't a puppet, said Eileen. She's got her own mind. You. <laughs> he laughed in wonderment, it seemed. You have no idea how persistently manipulative you are. I... I know how you operate. Asking the leading question, making the casual observation, and if you can't control the situation, you pretend it doesn't exist. You barely acknowledged me or Betty's boyfriend at the Christmas party except to check me out and then dismiss me. You made me feel like a speck. This is how you treat the man your sister's in love with? He paused and watched her reel at the affront. From the look you're giving me right now, I'm guessing that no one has ever treated you as rudely as you treated me. He said, I consider it an honor to do so. He bowed, a grand low dip, with a swing of an imaginary hat. He straightened up and stepped backward into an empty spot behind him without looking. I had Giles show it, bastard, she thought. If I had any guilt about influencing Frida about you, it is gone. Thank God she's with David. David, asked Sam. Not that Kendall you brought to Oliver. He's not right for her. He's stable, reliable, and treats her like a queen. She's not excited about him. He said, she couldn't be. Eileen said, after what Frida's been through, she needs stability. Wrong, he said definitively. Frida needs excitement, desperately, especially after what she's been through. She was with Greg for nine years. He was stable and reliable. Exactly, he said. You are only making my point. You are making his point. Or you are making his point, said the woman in the blue dress. Eileen turned behind her to glare as the package slipped out of her grasp and hit the stone floor with a splat. Sam picked it up before she had a chance. He read the address on the envelope and his eyes shot wide open. He handed the package back. Now he'd feel sorry for her and stop his tirade. For the first time, she welcomed the pity. He said, If you'd been paying attention to your own relationship instead of interfering with mine, neither one of us would have been dumped. I'm glad Peter's divorcing you. He deserves better. Sam turned around, just in time to step to the front of the line and up to the open clerk's window on the right. Blue dress said, You should mind your own business. Eileen turned around, face pinched with frustration and indignation. She spit, you're one to talk. Seconds later, Eileen moved to the available window on the left. She, she turned over the package. In the corner of her eye, she saw Sam leave. She concluded her mailing and left. That was the first time Eileen and Sam had exchanged thoughts and ideas. Swiftly, he deflated and insulted her. She was impressed. He was right, of course. She'd barely thought of him as anything but an appropriate boy to be dismissed. But Sam was more of a man than Eileen had previously assumed. More intelligent, observant, articulate, handsome, couldn't deny those eyes, and pissed off. Quite a conversation, she thought. It would not be their last. Page 303, Chapter 37, Thursday, September 18th. 3.03 p.m. Betty held the bomb in her hands. She was still undecided about whether to drop it 
or to put it in a drawer and let it collect dust. Her office door was closed. She needed the precious privacy, as if she didn't get enough of that on her own time. Peter was around, of course, but he'd been spending a lot of evenings at the bar on the corner, drinking himself into the courage to send the separation agreement to Eileen, which he'd messengered yesterday. Betty was against it, but Peter muttered something about wanting to move on with his life before he came, became a hard-up geezer. Inspired by Peter's initiative, Betty had brought the plastic binder to work. She put it in a large jiffy bag. She used the company scale and postal meter. She addressed the envelope to the Human Resources Department at headquarters. But for some reason, Betty couldn't walk down the hall and drop it in the outgoing mailbag. The phone rang. The ring was long, meaning the call came from inside the building. She picked up. Be strong, girl, said Gert. Huh? asked Betty, puzzled. Fluff your hair, said Gert. Betty did it reflexively. Then there was a knock at the door. Gert said, good luck, and hung up. Betty put the phone down and said, come in. She should have known. He said, is this a good time? Earl. The shock of seeing him made her drop the bomb in her lap. A good time for what? She asked, recovering enough to put the package in her bottom desk drawer before he could see it. He pushed back his long hair. It was a bit shorter, but the gesture was all him. She couldn't deny that he looked great. Butterflies flew around in her throat and chest. They felt stick. They felt heavy, though sticky. I just flew in from Chicago, he said. And boy, are your arms tired. There's a problem with the audiobook booths, he asked. Not that I'm aware of, she said. They were doing fine. Sales of audiobooks had increased tenfold as, tenfold as projected. The Uber bosses were happy. The customers were happy. Everything was keen. He said, I got a call to come here and fix the booths. Betty hadn't made the call. Was it the night manager? Or, Betty wondered, had it been someone else? Someone with T's blonde hair who quoted articles in Psychology Today about lowering dangerously high levels of the stress hormone cortisol by articulating feelings of regret, hurt, and anger. Betty said, you got a call to fix the booths, then go do it. Earl sat down instead. He smiled shyly. He looked across the table at him, the man who'd opened, up, opened her up with her hands. She could not speak. Those sticky butterflies were clogging her throat. Betty's cortisol levels weren't going anywhere but up. Earl said, I have a confession to make. She didn't want to hear it. An apology? He said, I think about you every day. Me too. She did. She did. Why lie? He said, this is a first for me. Missing someone? Yes, he said. You've never missed your son? She asked. That got him. She thoroughly enjoyed his stricken expression. He said, I have an arrangement with his mother that prevents me from spending a lot of time with him. Honestly, I don't know him well enough to miss him. Betty said, how disassociative of you. Earl said, whatever you found out about the situation, you can't possibly understand the nuances. I'd like to tell you the whole story, but that'll take a while and we have other things to discuss. The weather, she asked. I want to start over with you, he said. Betty said, but your work here is done. When she said here, she pointed at her chest. I want to start over as equals. You don't want to control me anymore, she asked. I'm no longer your project. You've stopped wanting to improve me, to shepherd me into the world as a slimmer, better dressed, and therefore more valuable member of society. She said, you have every right to be angry. I don't think I can handle equality, Earl. She said, it's too much pressure for me to think, to have to think for myself. I might wear the wrong shirt or eat the wrong food. I might watch a bad movie and like it. I might even have friends or family who annoy you. He waved his hands, encouraging her to keep it coming. Go ahead, he said. Get it all out. You see, she said, you're already telling me what to do. Earl leaned forward, elbows on her desk. She leaned back as far as she could. 
She reminded herself of all the lies he'd told her, all the cheats on his expenses. That cheat brooch. He said, as I recall, you liked it when I told you what to do in my hotel room. Her heart flopped a tiny bit. He was right. It had been thrilling to be controlled sexually. Submission stripped away, as it were, her self-consciousness about her body and inexperience. He was masterful. He made her feel safe. One would think being dominated would inspire the opposite reaction. Unsafe, vulnerable, but not for Betty. Once she sank into the role, it took a while, she dissolved in the palm of his hand. She said, I faked every orgasm. Earl sighed wearily. I've had enough, he said standing. If the audiobook booths aren't broken, I'm going to my hotel. Union Square, same place. I'll be there all night. If you want me back, or want me at all, even for one night, I'm available. Earl moved from sitting to standing. His body revealed her inch by inch. To, revealed to her, inch by inch. The sight made her waver. One more night of him wouldn't hurt her psyche, would it? She was about to say, wait, when the phone rang. She picked it up. Yes? It's me. Peter, will you be home tonight? Maybe not, she said, looking at Earl. Why not? Asked Peter. Can't say. Please cancel your plans, he begged. Eileen sent in the countersign separation agreement already. It's over. She didn't ask me to tear it up. Shit, she said. Earl scowled. He hated it when she cursed. If you didn't want her to sign it, you shouldn't have sent it to, sent it to her. You can tell me how stupid I am all you want, even that would be better than being alone tonight, Peter said. I'll get a movie, anything you want, and booze, just name it. Earl's hair hung against his cheekbones in the way that used to make her swoon. He drummed his belt buckle with his fingertips impatiently at the insult of being kept waiting by the woman who'd once jumped at his word. The belt buckle drumming did it, broke the spell. For the first time, Betty saw him as just a guy, not a magician with flying fingers, not a heartless villain. He was just some guy she knew once. No one of consequence. Not anymore. Betty said into the phone, Braveheart, white rations, and get pot, too. Great, said Peter. Thanks, Betty. She hung up. The phone rang again. Do you need to be re rescued? said Gert. Betty said, no. She hung up. To Earl, she said, I've got plans tonight with a man who might not be as exciting as you, but he's kind and sweet and desperately in love. She didn't explain that Peter was desperately in love with her sister, of course. Earl raised his eyebrows. A video date? Alcohol and pot? You'll get the munchies and eat the wallpaper. She said, if you've ever condescended to visit my apartment, you'd know that I don't have wallpaper. And Braveheart is a brilliant film. A much higher caliber than, say, Anal Intruder, which is probably what you'll watch tonight. She paused. And by the way, fuck you, piece of shit. Asshole for saying anything about my eating habits, dickhead. Her former lover, the man she once wanted to marry, shook his head and grimaced at her like he'd been for force-fed rotten meat. He said, One day you'll see that our past is just the first chapter of our story. She said, having listened to the first chapter, I'll pass on buying the book. Betty would not contact him. She wouldn't waver again. She'd given him the power in the relationship. And now Betty wanted to grab it back. Every time she'd worn uncomfortable clothes for him, ordered a salad when she wanted pasta, stopped herself from cursing, waited hours for him to call her on a weekend, abstained from alcohol, put on makeup, or prayed he'd come back, Betty had screwed herself. And if screwing Earl meant screwing herself, well, she could do that on her own anyway. Betty said, before you go and do let the door hit you on the ass on the way out, I have something for you. She reached into her bottom desk drawer and pulled out the hefty envelope with the proof of his misdoings. She handed it to him and said, this was my project. I was excited about it because it kept me connected to you. I'm not excited anymore. And that's where we'll stop this section, starting next time on chapter 38. Just one more to go, so catch me next time. I will announce the next read next time. Not so perfect, man.
Almost done. See you next time. Bye.